Hello everyone, welcome back to the continuation of Joan of Arc. The fate of France decided. We were up at dawn and after mass we started. In the hall we met the master of the house, who was grieved, good man, to see Joan going breakfastless to such a day's work and begged her to wait and eat, but she couldn't afford the time, that is to say, she couldn't afford the patience, she being in such a blaze of anxiety to get up that last remaining Bastille which stood between her and the completion of her first great step in the rescue and redemption of France. Boucher put her another plea in, but think we poor, diligent citizens who have hardly known the flavour of fish for these many months have spoil of that sort again, and we owe it to you. There's a noble shad for breakfast. Wait, be persuaded. Joan said, Oh, there's going to be fish in the plenty. When this day's work is done, the whole riverfront will be yours to do as you please with. Ah, your excellency will do well, that I know. But we don't require quite that much, even of you. You shall have a month for it in place of a day. Now be beguiled, wait and eat. There's a saying that he that would cross a river twice in the same day in a boat will do well to eat fish for luck, lest he have an accident. That doesn't fit my case, for today I cross but once in a boat. Oh, don't say that. Aren't you coming back to us? Yes, but not in a boat. How then? By the bridge. Listen to that. By the bridge. Now stop this jesting, dear general, and do as I would have done you. It's a noble fish. Be good then, and save me some for supper, and I will bring one of those Englishmen with me, and he shall have his share. Ah, well, have your way if you must. But he that fast must attempt, but little and stop early. When shall you be back? When we've raised the siege of Orleans. Forward! We were off. The streets were full of citizens and groups and squads of soldiers, but the spectacle was melancholy. There was not a smile anywhere, but only universal gloom. It was as if some vast calamity had smitten all hope and cheer dead. We were not used to this and were astonished, but when they saw the maid, there was an immediate stir, and the eager question flew from mouth to mouth, where is she going? Whither is she bound? Joan heard it and called out, Whither would ye suppose I am going to take the Tyrells? It would not be possible for any to describe how those few words turned that morning into joy, into exaltation, into frenzy, and how a storm of huzzas burst out and swept down the streets in every direction and woke those corpse-like multitudes to vivid life and action and turmoil in a moment. The soldiers broke from the crowd and came flocking into our standard, and many of the citizens ran and got pikes and halberds and joined us. As we moved on, our members increased steadily, and the hurraying continued. Yes, we moved through a solid cloud of noise, as you may say, and all the windows on both sides contributed to it, for they were filled with excited people. You see... The council had closed the Burgundy Gate and placed a strong force there, under the stone soldier Raoul de Gucour, Bailey of Orleans, with orders to prevent Joan from getting out and resuming the attack on the Torrells. And this shameful thing had plunged the city into sorrow and despair. But that feeling was gone now. They believed the maid was a match for the council, and they were right. When we reached the gate, John told Gokor to open it and let her pass. He said it would be impossible to do this, for his orders were from the council and were strict. John said, There is no authority above mine but the king's. If you have an order from the king, produce it. I cannot claim to have an order from him, General. Then make way, or take the consequences. He began to argue the case. For it was like the rest of the tribe, always ready to fight with words, not acts. But in the midst of the gabble, Joan interrupted with a tense order. Charge! We came with a rush, 
and brief work we made of that small job. It was good to see the bailiff's prize. He was not used to this unsentimental promptness. He said afterward that he was cut off in the midst of what he was saying, in the midst of an argument by which he could have proved that he could not let Joan pass on, argument which Joan could not have answered. Still, it appears she did answer it, said the person he was talking to. We swung through the gate in great style with a vast accession of noise, the most of which was laughter, and soon our van was over the river and moving down against the Torrells. First we must take a supporting work called Boulevard, and which was otherwise, otherwise usually nameless, before we could assault the Great Bastille. Its rear communicated with the Bastille by a drawbridge, under which ran a swift and deep strip of the lure. The boulevard was strong, and the noise doubted our ability to take it. But Joan, Joan had no such doubt. She pounded it with artillery all the forenoon. Then about noon she ordered an assault and led it herself. We poured into the fosse through the smoke and the tempest of missiles, and Joan, shouting encouragements to her men, started to climb a scaling ladder. When that misfortune happened, which we knew was to happen, the iron bolt from an arbor-quest struck between her neck and her shoulder, and tore its way down through her armour, which she felt the sharp pain, and saw her blood gushing over her breast. She was frightened, poor girl, and as she sank to the ground, she began to cry bitterly. The English sent up a glad shout, and came surging down in a strong force to take her, and then for a few minutes the might of both adversaries was concentrated upon that spot. Over her and above her, English and French fought with desperation, for she stood for France. Indeed, she was France to both sides. Whichever won, her won France, and could keep it forever. Right there in that small spot, and in ten minutes by the clock, the fate of France for all time was to be decided, and was decided. If the English had captured Joan then, well, Charles the Seventh would have thrown the country. The Treaty of Troyes would have held good, and France, already English property, would have become, without further dispute, an English province. Two so remain until Judgment Day. A nationality and a kingdom were at stake there, and no more time to decide it than it takes a hard boil an egg. It was the most momentous ten minutes that the clock has ever ticked in France, or ever will. Whenever you read in histories about hours or days or weeks in which the fate of one or another nation hung in the balance, do not you fail to remember, nor your French hearts to beat the quicker for the remembrance, the ten minutes that France, called otherwise Joan of Arc, lay bleeding in the fosse that day, with two nations struggling over her for possession. And he will not forget the dwarf, for he stood over her and did the work of any six of the others. He swung his axe with both hands. Whenever it came down, he said those two words, For France! And a splintered helmet flew like eggshells, and the skull that carried it had learned its manners and would offend the French no more. He piled a bulwark of ironclad dead in front of him and fought from behind it. And at last, when the victory was ours, we closed about him, shielding him, and he ran up the ladder with Joan as easily as any other man would carry a child and bore her out of the battle. A great crowd, follow crowd following and anxious, for she was drenched with blood to her feet. Half of it was her own. The other half was English, for bodies had fallen across her as she lay and poured their red. Life streams over her. One couldn't see the white armour now, with that awful dressing over it. The iron bolt was still in the wound. Some say it projected out behind the shoulder. It may be. I did not wish to see, and did not try to. It was pulled out, and the pain Joan. Well, it made her cry again, the poor thing. Some say she pulled it out herself, because others refused, saying they could not bear to hurt her. And to this I do not know, 
I only know it was pulled out and that the wound was treated with oil and promptly dressed. Joan lay on the grass, weak and suffering, hour after hour, but still insisting that the fight go on, which it did, but not to much purpose, for it was only under her eye that men were heroes and not afraid. They were like the paladin. I think he was afraid of his shadow. I mean, in the afternoon, when it was very big and long, but when he was under Joan's eye and the inspiration of her great spirit, what was he afraid of? Nothing in this world, and that is just the truth. Toward night, though I gave it up, Joan heard the bugles. What? she cried, sounding the retreat. Her wound was forgotten in a moment. She countermanded the order and sent another to the officer in command of battery to stand ready to fire five shots in quick succession. This was a signal to the force on the Orleans side of the river, under La Hare, who was not as some of the historians say, with us. It was to be given whenever Joan should feel sure the boulevard was about to fall into her hands. Then that force must make a counter-attack on the Torrells by way of the bridge. Joan mounted her horse now, with her staff about her. And when our people saw us coming, they raised a great shout, and were at once eager for another assault on the boulevard. Joan rode straight to the force, where she had received her wound, and standing there in the rain of bolts and arrows, she ordered the paladin to let her long stand a blow free, and to note when its fringes should touch the fortress. Presently, he said, it touches. Now then, said Joan, to the waiting battalions. The place is yours. Enter in. Bugle sound and assault. Now! Then all go together. Go! And go it was. You never saw anything like it. We swarmed up the ladders and over the battlements like a wave, and the place was our property. Why, one might live a thousand years and never see so gorgeous thing again. There, hand to hand, we fought like wild beasts, for there was no give up to those English. There was no way, no convince one of them but to kill, and even then be doubted. At least so it was thought in those days and maintained by many. We were busy. We never heard the five cannon shots fired, but they were fired a moment after Joan had ordered the assault. And so while we were hammering, and being hammered in the small fortress, the reserve on the Orleans side poured across the bridge and attacked the Torrells from that side. A fireboat was brought down and moored under the drawbridge which connected the Torrells with the boulevard. Wherefore, when at last we drove our English ahead of us, and they tried to cross the drawbridge and join their friends in the Torrells. The burning timbers gave way under them and emptied them in a mass into the river in their heavy armour. And a pitiful sight it was to see brave men die such a death as that. Ah, oh, God pity them, said Joan, and wept to see the sorrowful spectacle. She said those gentle words and wept those compassionate tears, although one of those perishing men had grossly insulted her, with a coarse name three days before, when she had sent him a message, asking him to surrender. That was their leader. Sir Williams Glasdale, a most valorous knight. He was clothed all in steel, so he plunged under water like a lance, and of course came up no more. We soon patched a sort of bridge together and threw ourselves against the last stronghold of the English power that barred Orleans from friends and supplies. Before the sun was quite down, Joan's forever memorable day's work was finished. Her banner floated from the fortress of the Tyrells. Her promise was fulfilled. She had raged the whole siege of Orleans. The seven months belligerent was ended. The thing which the first generals of France had called impossible was accomplished, in spite of all that the king's ministers and war councils could do to prevent it. This little country maid, at seventeen, had carried her immortal task through, and had done it in four days. Good news travels fast, sometimes as well as bad. By the time we were ready to start homeward by the bridge, the whole city of Orleans, one red flame of bonfires, and the heavens blushed with satisfaction to see it, and the booming and bellowing of cannon and the banging of bells surpassed 
by great odds anything that even Orleans had attempted before in the way of noise. When we arrived, well, there's no describing that. Why, those acres of people that ploughed through shed tears enough to raise the river. There was not a face in the glare of those, oh, fires that hadn't tears streaming down it. And if Joan's feet had not been protected by iron, they would have kissed them off of her, I'm sure. Welcome, welcome to the maid of Orleans. That was the cry. I heard it. A hundred thousand times. Welcome to our maid. Some of them worded it. No other girl in all history has ever reached such a summit of glory as Joan of Arc reached that day. And do you think it turned to red? And that she sat up to enjoy that delicious music of homage and applause? No. Another girl would have done that, but not this one. That was the greatest heart and the simplest that ever beat. She went straight to bed and to sleep, like any tired child. And when the people found she was wounded and would rest, they shut off all passage and traffic in that region and stood guard themselves the whole night through to see that her slumbers were not disturbed. They said, She has given us peace. She shall have peace herself. All knew that the region would be empty of English next day, and all said that neither the present citizens nor their posterity would ever cease to hold that day sacred to the memory of Joan of Arc. The word has been true for more than sixty years. It will continue so always. Orleans will never forget the 8th of May, nor ever fail to celebrate it. It is Joan of Arc's day, and holy. It is still celebrated every year with civic and military pomps and solemnities. And that's the end of that part of Joan of Arc. And wow. Again, she amazes me every time I read about her and read about what really happened. It touches my heart and amazes me. Thank you for listening and many blessings.